style of the particles that I'll use. Uh, sitting in an electron micrograph, they're a bunch of spheres all of the same size, about 10 microns in diameter. Throw them into a low temperature plasma and they get charged and they repel one another and then they space out by typically about a Debye length. This is a still image from one of our experiments. So they're big enough that you can actually see. The, if I mentioned that they're highly charged and you can see a consequence of that high charge here because the particles arrange themselves in a lattice with a repelling one another so that they get kind of a fixed spacing and arrange these nice straight rows. Now, other names that are used for this topic of dusty plasmas include complex plasma and fine particle plasma. It's kind of a disadvantage that we have in this particular discipline that we can't even agree on a name. And that all originates because of the name dusty. Dust, uh, dusty was a term uh, that came from English speaking astronomers, but in some countries, the word dusty translates as something rather unpleasant, like filthy or even worse. And so Japanese especially, they just, you cannot get a Japanese person to say that word dusty plasma. Now they'll say fine particle plasma, and a lot of Europeans will call it a complex plasma. Okay, who cares about dusty plasmas? Well, the first and original area would have been astronomy and space physics. The interstellar medium I mentioned is a dusty plasma, planetary, planet forming regions, uh, star forming regions are um, dusty plasmas. And then within a solar system, rings of Saturn and comet tails are examples of dusty plasmas. Now in manufacturing of semiconductors, particle contamination has always been a big problem. These small solid particles actually grow, they actually grow in a plasma. And then when you turn the plasma off, the particles just fall down onto your wafer and contaminate it. Now that's a bad thing. On the other hand, you can actually purposefully grow particles in a plasma to make for a, for, for a desired reason. And there are people who synthesize nanomaterials, for example, for their exotic photonic properties using plasmas. Now, what I do is I do fundamental science to investigate things like strongly coupled plasmas, statistical physics. I'll test fundamental statistical physics theories and, and kind of usual traditional plasma stuff, uh, do things like waves and instabilities. And in this talk, I'll be talking about kind of waves, shock waves. Now, aside from those three topics, the infusion power, dusty plasmas also matter. One of the reasons that they would care is because that the small solid particles that can flake off of limiters and the like can carry a lot of tritium inventory. And that's a, uh, expected to be a problem, for example, for eater. Okay, so what's the source of dust when it gets into a plasma? Well, it depends. In a tokamak, it might be flaking of deposited films or it might be bubbling and blistering of surfaces, especially after you implant a lot of alpha particles into them. Uh, so that helium bubbles up in there. So that's what can happen, for example, in a tokamak plasma. In the gas phase, you can have nucleation and coagulation of particles to uh, grow. I'll say more about that shortly. And then another thing you can do is just, well, do what I do. I just buy them from a vendor and I buy these precision plastic microspheres. Okay, so about the growing by accretion and coagulation. That's what happens in astrophysics, where you have gas phase formation in nebulae. You have a vapor that flows outward from a carbon star. And as it flows outward, it cools, then it nucleates to form little um, nanometer sized particles that then collect individual atoms of carbon and uh, silicon and iron, and that grows a dust particle. Then those dust particles grow further by continued accretion or by coagulation. And that's really the genesis of growing a planetesimal and then a terrestrial planet like Earth. So Earth, you know, originally came from, um, you know, a star forming region in a nebula. And uh, it was, you know, that's what we're made of, dusty plasma. Okay, so the dust in our fundamental science experiments though is something different. I tip and tend to use these polymer microspheres. They're monodispersed, which means they all have the same diameter pretty much. Typically, I can specify one micron or 10 micron or anything in between when I buy them from the manufacturer. And the way I introduce them into the plasma is I use something that's kind of like a salt shaker, shaking the particles in from above. Okay, now the particles get a big charge. As I mentioned earlier, that's one of the big things about dusty plasmas is the particles get a big charge and it gets a big charge from co collecting an unequal number of electrons and ions. Now, if you collect only electrons and ions, well, it's going to give you a negative charge, and that's because of the higher velocities of electrons in a plasma. And that's what's going to happen in my experiments. But there are kinds of plasmas where you also have electron emission. And when you have electron emission due to photoemission that happens in the solar system, or secondary emission or thermionic emission, that can happen in the particles in a scrape-off layer of tokamak, 
Well, under those circumstances, it's possible for you to get not a negative charge, but a positive charge. But that's, these emission pro, uh, processes are not going to happen in my experiments. We're just going to have a negative charge because we're just going to be collecting electrons and ions. Now, the equilibrium charge happens when you have a total current of zero. See, this particle doesn't have any wires connected to it to carry current away. So if it goes to a uh, steady potential, uh, then it, it can only do that by making the electron current balance the ion current. Now, Spitzer, in one of his fine and very thin books, uh, uh, presented a derivation of how it's about minus two and a half times the electron temperature is going to be the surface potential, the floating potential on this grain. That's if you have hydrogen with the uh, ions and electrons at the same temperature. And just as a numerical example, suppose you had one EV for the electrons and you had one micron radius for the particles. Well, then the charge will work out to about minus 1700 elementary charges. And that's for one micron. Turns out the charge is proportional to the first power of the particle diameter. So it's, it's easy to get this up you know, to 10,000 elementary charges. 10,000 elementary charges happens all the time in my experiments. So if they have 10,000 elementary charges, well, if you think about it, the potential energy between two of them, the inner particle potential energy goes like Q squared. Hey, if you got 10,000 for Q, Q squared is going to be a really big number. So you get really, really big inner particle potential energies. And that means that the potential energies between particles can be a lot bigger than the translational kinetic energy of the particles. And so that means then that that Coulomb coupling parameter gamma can be big. Now, most plasmas, are weakly coupled. They'll behave like a gas with collisions not dominating everything. But in a strongly coupled plasma where gamma is much greater than one, it can behave like a liquid or a solid and collisions are everything. Particles are just constantly colliding massively with their nearest neighbors to such an extent that they can hardly move. Now they're kind of trapped in a cage by their nearest neighbors. So now the forces that are acting on a particle in dusty plasma, well, if a particle has a radius A, the, the force that's most interesting to me is the Coulomb force, Q times E. And that's proportional to the first power of the radius. And in my experiments, that provides levitation, keeps my particles from falling to the bottom of my chamber. It also provides repulsion. Now, what about the Lorentz force? A lot of people in plasma physics or all areas of plasma physics, except mine, um, are excuse interested. Me, John. Excuse yes? me, John. Uh, we see your slides in presenter's mode. Can you share the full screen? Share the full screen. OK. Yeah, thanks. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. Let's see. Now you're probably looking at a slide sorter now? Yeah. OK. Let's see if I can figure out how to do that. Well, yeah, I don't normally use this particular computer, which has two monitors, and that's the problem. Let's see. Is there some way to toggle that? How about the display setting in the on the Hide top? presenter view. Maybe that'll do it. Oh. OK, now I'll, now do you see um, the, the full screen, or is you still in, in something less? Uh, it's, it's in editing mode, I guess. OK, so it, that's not good. OK. Um, I don't think it really matters that much, John. Uh, if okay. we see it this way, it looks fine to me. OK, really sorry. Matter. Let's see, I can shrink the um, next slide there. So yeah. that, okay. yeah, that's better. Maybe that's a little bit better. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, magnetic fields, um, well, the, the, lower, the Larmor radius for these um, particles is typically big, like uh, in Saturn's rings, uh, the Larmor radius is as big as the Saturnian radius. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's kind of hard to magnetize our particles. So it's mostly the Coulomb force that we're after. Now, gravitational force is important for us. Um, because our particles are bigger than about 0.1 microns. Now, aside from these uh, forces, there's a whole bunch of others that I won't talk about right now for the sake of brevity. Now, the experiments I'm going to be talking about are done in a capacitively coupled radio frequency glow discharge plasma. Here's a photograph of the chamber. The pink glow that you see inside the chamber is coming from um, uh, the weakly ionized argon plasma. And there's this lower electrode, which is everything for us. That lower electrode right there uh, has a radio frequency voltage applied to it as compared to the grounded chamber walls. That gives us the plasma. And then we're going to levitate the microparticles just above that lower electrode. 
So how's that levitation work? Well, zooming in here, the lower electrode is a, has a negative bias on it due to a capacitor. So there's a big thick sheath, a non-neutral region above that lower electrode where there's a big electric field. That big electric field levitates our negatively charged particle upward uh, against the downward force of gravity. So that's how we can levitate one grain. And if we want to put a whole bunch of grains in, we can form a two-dimensional layer. And that's because the sheath is slightly curved. Think of it as like a bowl. And just like throwing grains of sand into a shallow bowl, if you don't throw in too many, it'll just form a single layer. And that's what happens here. And the particle spacing here is typically about, um, about one you know, Debye length is what the way it typically works out. Okay, here's a view inside uh, our chamber, one of our chambers where you can see the green, these green particles, well, they're not fundamentally green, but they're being lit by a green laser beam. And then there's also a red laser beam in, adds a little bit of color. You can see the individual particles. You can also see that they tend to be arranged in rows, which is kind of cool. Okay, and so that's a two dimensional layer. There, there's not a second or third layer here, it's all just a single layer. Now, the earliest lab experiments that were done with dusty plasmas were similarly done with these capacitively coupled radio frequency plasmas. And the first one was Gary Selwyn, who at that time was at IBM in 1989, discovered that particles were growing spontaneously in his plasma and they could be electrically levitated and viewed with a camera and, and laser illumination. One of the first experiments with observing waves in a dusty plasma was done by my colleague Bob Merlino and Nick D'Angelo, 1995. You can see a still image from a video camera here where you can actually see the layers of concentrations of dust density for a wave that's propagating, in this case, in a Q machine. That was 1995. Now, there are uh, well, going back to this, because it's a wave, you could ask, you know, this one's clearly a nonlinear wave. Uh, it goes from like 100% uh, modulation of the dust density right there. You could think about it, uh, one of the types of nonlinear waves that you could get would be a shock wave. And shock waves are important in a lot of places in plasma physics, including, for example, warm dense matter. Warm dense matter is typically made experimentally by taking a solid and then blasting it with a beam, in this case, an ion beam. And then you end up with a temperature of about, you know, one electron volt. And in this case right there, the ion beam is launched at some solid layer, which then creates a shock. And so then they'll try to observe these shocks, but they'll study these shocks, you know, by like X-ray imaging. They have no way of tracking the motion of individual ions, for example, in that shock. But that's something that we can do in our dusty plasma experiments. We can image individual particles in a shock. And that's what this whole talk is all about. So what, what uh, should we know about shock waves? Well, a shock wave in general is a nonlinear supersonic compressional pulse. In gas dynamics, if you had just a cylinder with a piston, the piston moves at one velocity, a shock can form ahead of it moving a little bit faster. And in an idealized case, you'll get a sharp gradient in the number density uh, that in idealized would be a discontinuity, but in actual practice, it would have a finite thickness. In gas dynamics, the finite thickness would arise from dissipative effects like viscosity. Now, here's a couple of definitions. The sound speed is going to be CL. And by the way, in a dusty plasma, the sound speed is about two centimeters per second. That's because we have an incredibly soft material. I figured out that it seems to be, as far as I can tell, the second softest material in the world, uh, 20 orders of magnitude softer than iron. And the one kind of material that's actually softer than that would be a pure ion plasma. Pure ion plasma crystals are even 10 orders of magnitude softer yet. But in my case, the sound speed is just about um, uh, two centimeters per second. So it's easy to make things that are supersonic. The shock is going to have a Mach number that's different from the Mach number for the exciter. So the exciter and the shock uh, uh, are going to be moving at two different speeds. Shock's always fundamentally got to move at a faster speed. Now there's an empirical expression uh, relating these two quantities. And here it is, it's just a linear expression that the shock Mach number is one plus a Mach number times some coefficient s. And this coefficient s, this slope, it should give you some insight into the equation of state. And this empirical expression has previously been observed in shocks in metals, and it's been observed in shocks in liquids. Um, but interestingly, as far as I can tell, there's not a good fundamental theory for this uh, relationship. So theorists, if you're ever looking for a problem to work on, here's one. Uh, what's the fundamental theory underlying this uh, empirical observation that everybody, including me, it is going to observe that the shock number is moving uh, linearly at a linear relationship to the exciter speed. 
S should have something to do with like the compressibility of the material. Uh, I started to work on that a little bit myself, but ultimately gave up on it. Okay, so in the experiment that we're going to do, we're going to have a motorized movement of an exciter. And our exciter is not a piston, it's just going to be a wire. And that wire is going to have a negative charge on it. It's electrically floating. So just like the dust grains, it's electrically floating. And so it's going to have the same polarity as the dust grains. It's going to repel the dust grains. And so you're going to be seeing movies where I'm going to have this wire moving, and it's going to chase all these microparticles away. It repels them. OK, and here's what this wire looks like, a um, photo that uh, I took with a, a tape measure. Here's an image of it inside the chamber. Um, the graduate student Anton made, did 3D printing to make these plastic parts as small as he could so it didn't soak up too much plasma inside the chamber. And then it's mounted externally on a motor drive, kind of looks like a probe shaft drive. And in fact, uh, this connector on it here was some connector like I used to use as a graduate student for Langmuir probes. And this, um, I'll, I'll show you a, a video here of it moving. And that uh, moves in at, you know, some like five, 10 centimeters per second. And that's enough to be supersonic. Okay, so I'll play that again here. Uh, see if it'll play again. There we go. So that's uh, how we're going to be pushing that wire in, in the experiment. Now we also have to image our particles and we're gonna do that primarily with a top view camera that's operating at nearly a thousand frames per second. And we illuminate the particles with a kind of a low power laser beam that's uh, distributed into a sheet, into a horizontal sheet. Okay, now here you can see a movie uh, of particles and there's the wire, that's the wire right there moving in and you can see the wires chasing particles away and that one was a wire that was moved continuously. In the bottom you can see a separate experimental run where we moved the wire and then stopped it. And the latter one where we stop it creates a kind of shock wave that we would call a blast wave. Blast waves are something where the you have an impulsive input of energy to create the shock and then the input of energy stops. The continuous motion is kind of like the textbook case of a piston moving down a cylinder. Now, one thing that you can notice is you can see what the individual particles are doing in these shocks. And that's one thing that's really cool. You can't do it in, you know, warm, dense matter or any other kind of substance. Really, uh, this is it, uh, an experiment where you can see the individual particles and how they move past one another as a shock goes by. Okay, the experimental conditions, I was using argon gas at, um, you know, five orders of magnitude less uh, pressure than at one atmosphere. And I was preparing the plasma by 13 megahertz radio frequency high voltages that are, weren't really all that high voltage, just 184 volt peak to peak. The microparticles that I were using were these melamine formaldehyde polymer particles, like they're about nine microns in diameter and their number density when they spread out in the plasma was about one per square millimeter. And that's because uh, the like this lattice constant here in this triangular lattice worked out to be about 0.8 millimeters. The charge on these particles was measured by a phonon spectrum method, and we determined that it was 14,000 elementary charges. The kind of nominal plasma frequency, there really isn't really a plasma frequency, by the way, in, any, in a 2D plasma, but, it, but if you fabricate one you know, by dimensional argument, uh, it works out to be 49 inverse seconds. The sound speed was calculated from, with those inputs to be 20 millimeters per second. So 20 millimeters per second is the longitudinal sound speed. And then we're going to move that wire at greater than 20 millimeters a second to create a shock wave. Now here's the whole camera field of view. And the region of interest is defined by this yellow border here. And that's the region that we're going to analyze. And the shock's going to propagate from left to right. That's the plus X direction. Okay. Oh, and, and the frame rate is 870 frames per second. So that frame rate's enough for us to track the motion of individual particles, see the shock moving and everything. Okay, if you take one still image, and blow it up, you know, the particle doesn't just fill one pixel, it fills lots of pixels. And that's because of diffraction. If it weren't for diffraction, uh, the particle would just be, you know, one pixel. But it's actually nice that it fills multiple uh, pixels because we can cut, find the x, y coordinates of that particle with great precision. Each pixel in this image is just uh, an intensity, which is an integer number at some position. If you want to think about what's a bit mapped image, it's just an integer array. It's two dimensional integer array is what a mapped images and from that um, two-dimensional from that uh, data you can calculate the position of one particle using kind of a like like a center of mass you know it's the intensity multiplied by position divided by an intensity summed over all the pixels that are within one particle 
And with this method, you can get the position of a particle measured to a precision of about one tenth of a pixel. Then after we've got the position, we can calculate, if we want it, we can calculate the velocity and we can track, track individual particles between frames. Okay, so here's some still images from one of our pulses where you can see the pulse at an early time, middle time, and then a late time. One thing you'll notice here is that the amplitude is quite high. See the number density here got increased by a factor of two or more in this compressional pulse. So it's definitely not linear, it's nonlinear. And uh, these density profiles here, you can see uh, how the uh, aerial density um, is distributed at these, in these three video frames. Okay, now I mentioned that it has a large amplitude and it also has a high gradient at its leading edge. You can see that here, for example. And it's also supersonic. I'll show you that in the next slide. And these three qualities, large amplitude, high gradient and supersonic, those are the three qualities that I look for to identify the pulse as being a shock. So every one of our papers on this topic will always have a paragraph that says, we've identified a nonlinear amplitude, we've identified a high gradient, and it is supersonic. And based on those three qualities, we are going as experimenters to interpret this pulse as a shock. And at that point in the paper, bingo, we quit calling it a pulse and we start calling it a shock. Okay, so how do we measure the speed of this pulse? We take the position of that peak in the profile uh, and at different times we're imaging, remember at 870 frames a second. So we're getting lots of images of the uh, particle cloud and we can get the peak of the pulse as a function of time and fit it to a line. And we get, for example, 117 millimeters per second, which is six times greater than the sound speed of 19 millimeters per second. That was at an exciter speed of 100 millimeters per second. Now, if we did a separate experimental run at 63 millimeters per second, it's a little bit slower on the exciter speed, then the shock speed ends up being a little bit less. But it's still greatly supersonic with a Mach number of about four. In this case right here, which is our fastest run, we got a Mach number of up to 6.2. And what limited us uh, there was just the um, motor drive. Like a lot of things in plasma physics, if we just had a bigger power supply, hey, we could have pushed those numbers up even higher. Okay, so we get these different um, Mach numbers for the pulse or the shock. And that's going to be the right hand axis right here in dimensionless form in dimensional four millimeters per second. It's on the left hand axis. The horizontal axis in this graph is the exciter speed. That's how fast we were pushing that wire in. And we did uh, here five different runs and the wire was moving at speeds ranging from three to five times the, the sound speed. And so then we get these five data points, which we can fit to a line that passes through the data point one, you know, where the, the intercept here, if I were able to show you the intercept, it would go have an intercept of one. We forced it to one. So this is only one free parameter for the fit. That's that slope. And so this basically confirms that empirical expression that I mentioned that there doesn't seem to be a fundamental theory for, but there really ought to be, uh, that the Mach number for the shock is the Mach number of the exciter multiplied by some coefficient, which must depend on some material property like compressibility, and then that's plus one. So that was uh, one paper that we had, and that one was published in Physical Review E, and uh, some of the conclusions for that effort was we had a new excitation scheme for shocks, achieving Mach numbers of up to 6.2. We can indiv image individual particles in these shocks, and we obtained the dependence of the shock speed on the exciter speed and confirmed that it obeyed that empirical expression that is also obeyed by various liquids uh, and uh, other substances. So in principle, the, the measurement of this coefficient S could be useful for testing equations of state, but as far as I can tell, the, the theory is lacking for us to be able to directly go from the value of the coefficient to something meaningful. Okay, so that's one experiment. And that was published, uh, you know, uh, last year in Physical Review E. Now we're going to do another experiment here that, that's intended to study shock widths. And here's the idea in nature, discontinuities really don't happen. I mean, this is an idealized thing for like ranking Hugonio relations that it's a discontinuity. But in real substances, even in gases, you don't have a discontinuity. In a gas, a shock will have a finite thickness due to things like viscosity. There will there'll be a shock width in our experiment too, and we're going to measure it. And we're going to measure it two ways in the we're going to shock a crystal, like you saw earlier, and then I'm also going to shock a liquid. Now, how are we going to shock a liquid? Well, we got to take this crystal, like this crystal that you see right here, and we have to melt it. 
and I'll tell you how we're going to melt it here. What we're going to do is use laser radiation pressure force. We're going to take powerful lasers. I've got the 17 watt continuous wave laser, and we're going to move it around. And when it hits a particle, these particles are kind of transparent and kind of act like a lens. It deflects the rays of light. And those rays of light are carrying photons of momentum. And those photons' momentum is deflected, and that means um, that the particle has to acquire some momentum. So mo momentum is imparted to a particle. That's the radiation pressure force that we're going to use. And so I'm going to use actually two laser beams bouncing off a pair of scanning mirrors. The scanning mirrors are rastering these laser beams right and left to and fro to cover this entire particle cloud. Now the result of this, here's a still image of a solid, and here's a still image with laser heating, what I call a, li a liquid. And you can see there's a greater amount of disorder for this liquid. Now, what is it that really liquefied here? Well, the particles are still solid. So these dust particles, you know, they're still solid polymer particles. They did not melt internally. They're still pretty much at room temperature, you know, as far as their internal temperature. What they gained is an external kind of translational kinetic energy, a translational temperature, and that translational temperature was great enough that the crystal could melt. And that's what melts the arrangement. So it's not actually the internal particle itself that's melting, it's just the arrangement of the particles that's melting. Okay, so uh, we're going to be measuring the profile of number density, and to do that we're going to take a still image and then we're going to bend this and kind of count the particles in it. And we'll use cloud in cell weighting, which we borrow from the um, PIC code people. Cloud in cell weighting, when a particle is close to a boundary, how do we assign it from one grid to another? We, we use cloud in cell weighting. And if we do that with a bin width, a certain bin width, we get this for the density profile. It looks kind of chunky. I uh, can't really tell what the shock width is here. So let's go with a thinner bin width. Okay, thinner bin width, that looks like a problem now, it's too noisy. And so what do we do? Well, that was an analysis of just one image. What we can do is take advantage of the fact that the shock retains pretty much the same shape for a while. And so we're going to actually average over 50 frames, 50 images, 50 consecutive images at 870 frames a second. And we're going to use Galilean transformation, taking advantage of the fact that the pulse is moving at a constant speed. And that allows us to use a narrow bin width, and then we can smooth it further with this Svitsky Golay uh, filtering. So that gives us this black curve for the density profile, the aerial number density profile in the shot. Then what we can do is try to find two asymptotes right here. Now, this is intended to find the shock width, and there's no fundamental universally agreed definition for what is a shock width. There are several different ways of measuring it, and this is one of them, where you take the peak here, and then you take the intersection of the asymptote there, and the distance between those two uh, locations that's identified as being the shock width. In this case, it works out to be three interparticle distances, about one millimeter. And so that ends up being one of our crucial results that the uh, shock width is about three interparticle distances. It's not a discontinuity, it's finite in thickness, um, about three interparticle distances. And we did this experiment not just with a liquid and with a solid, but in the same conditions. And you can see that the density profile looks like it has a higher gradient in a liquid. And so that was an important discovery that nobody has been able to do in any other kind of substance, um, uh, observe a shock in both a solid and a liquid under otherwise identical conditions. And so what we find here is that the shock width, normalized by the interparticle spacing, tends to be about three or four, but it's always thicker in a solid. In a liquid, it's thinner. Uh, so like it, it, for this one run here where we move the, call it a piston, this uh, exciter at Mach number of 3.6, uh, you know, there was, a little, a, there was a significant difference between the shock widths. Go to a different run here with a Mach number of 3.2, again, a significant difference. Mach number of 2.8, again, a significant difference. The shock's always faster in a solid. And that's not something that anybody really had a fundamental reason to, to expect, as far as I know. I, I kind of thought that, you know, liquid, you'd have more dissipation, and therefore, in, in with more dissipation, that it would be thicker. But it turned out to be the other way. So it, to me, it's kind of a counterintuitive result, but that's the experimental result. Shocks are thinner in a liquid than in a solid for substances that otherwise have the same interparticle interactions. Now we can compare with one theory from gas dynamics. Gas dynamics, you have, you'll say their kinematic viscosity divided by a bulk velocity. That ratio should give you the shock thickness. And in that case, we do know our kinematic viscosity and we can calculate this and that would work out to 0.05 millimeters. But hey, it doesn't come anywhere close to agreeing with the measured shock thickness that we get of one millimeter. 
the hydrodynamic model couldn't be right anyway. Hydrodynamics essentially assumes that gradients are gentle enough that you're going to have you're going to be able to neglect um, the discrete particle nature, and that thickness right there is less than the interparticle spacing. So hydrodynamic model is bound to fail. John, could I interrupt just for a second? Yep. Uh, which kinematic viscosity are you discussing there? Is that the kinematic viscosity of the dust grains with one another or is something having to do with the background plasma? That's kinematic viscosity solely for the dust component. All right. So, the, so the, when the dust uh, component is liquid-like, um, it will have a, a shear viscosity. And when you take that shear viscosity and divide by the number density, uh, that gives you a kinematic viscosity which has the dimensions of a diffusion coefficient. And in this experiment, it, it works out to be about one square millimeter per second is the kinematic viscosity. And that's just arising because of the collisions between dust dust, uh, Coulomb dust dust collisions is the fundamental mechanism for that viscosity. Okay, so conclusions for this uh, shock width study. Uh, we found that the shock widths are typically about three to five interparticle distances. And the shock was thinner in a liquid than a solid, surprised me. Uh, hydrodynamic model fails. That was no big surprise. It couldn't really work because the, the shock is only a, a couple of particle spacings thick. So that's a, a conclusions for a, a second paper that was uh, that, that came out. Now, some future work that we may be doing with some of this data is analyzing trajectories of individual particles. What's especially cool about these shock experiments is that they are observed at a particle level. And we haven't fully exploited that fact yet. So we could be analyzing some of the trajectories of these particles as they slip by one another, for example. And there are a lot of ways that that could be done. One of the ways I'm going to quit uh, sharing this uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to share instead a uh, movie here. Let's see if I can find the movie. Here we go. OK, so here we're going to be watching a movie. Shocks. Uh, Piston's going to be moving from the top downward. So that wire is moving top downward in, in this uh, analysis of the experiment. You're going to see the shock starting uh, just shortly. OK, now we're starting to see the particles start to move. And what you're looking at are these polygons. The polygons show the order or disorder compared to neighbors. It's called a Voronoi polygon. And when you see something that's not green, that means it was a defect. Uh, OK, so let's see if I can play that again. So we start off with this crystal that only have a few defects in it. Otherwise, particles have six nearest neighbors. Six nearest neighbors, non-defect. This one has a five. That one has a seven. It's, those are defects. And those defects are nice and stable until this crystal uh, shock comes along. Shock comes along, it melts the crystal. Uh, you get lots and lots of defects. So this is one of many kinds of uh, ways that you can do particle level analysis in these shocks. OK, with that, I'm going to stop right here and uh, Thank all of you for uh, joining me, and I'll be happy to take any further questions. Uh, yeah, the, the movie actually didn't didn't play. For, oh, it didn't play at all. No, not uh, on my screen at least. Uh huh. I don't know if else saw it. Okay, um, let's see if I can try that again. All right, so let's see if we can try that again here. Share the screen. Okay, I'm going to specify. Um, video player. Okay, you should see a black screen now. Do you see a black screen? Yes. Okay, now I'm going to play. Oh, okay. Now do you see a, something that's mostly green? No. You don't. Okay. Oh, there. Seems, okay. I, I see it playing. Yeah, I see it playing too. I okay, see I'll, I'll try that again. It must be uh, the connection speeds. That, okay. That could be a factor, but I would think that you would at least see some green and maybe some halting movement. So I don't know. How, how many people here can see uh, green polygons? <laughs> Anybody? Looks, yep. looks great to me. Some people say yes. Some people hold yeah. up their hand. I guess we need no. All right. I just have a slow computer, I guess. Well, it could be some could be the fact that I'm not in Southern California. Maybe you guys have something good going on with a regional uh, uh, focus for your um, uh, for your talk, so you can all have a high bandwidth. All right. Um, so I guess we'll open it for questions now. Uh, does anybody have any questions for? Uh, Hands are up, Dan. I see. Uh, Sergi, 
You want to go uh, ahead? Hi, John. Hello, uh, Sergei. Uh, I have just a quick, quick uh, simple question. So you're talking about uh, uh, 2D structure, but then when you're launching the shock, quote unquote, whatever uh, you call the shock, yes. then uh, probably you do not have any more of this 2D structure in the particle going up and down. So therefore, this is uh, kind of not necessarily a being still 2D, they're becoming 3D. And, right. Uh, okay. How, how important is it? What do you think? Okay, I've got a slide for that. <laughs> All right, so I'll show that to you here. Let's see. Um, okay, so uh, there's a still image here that shows a side view camera. So there's a top view. Do you see a, 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 my pointer here? It's a, a, a mouse pointer. Yes. Okay, so that's a top view and this is a side view. And when we look at the side view, you can see that's just a single layer ahead of the shock. This is behind the shock, it's a single layer. And in between, there's a little bit of buckling, just a little bit of buckling where some particles are, are uh, getting such a high number density, it's energetically favorable for it to form two layers instead of one, but it doesn't do a whole lot of that. So um, let's see if I can magnify this a little bit here so that you can see it a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see. So you 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 uh, you assume that uh, this is not important uh, because this buckling uh, thickness is uh, still smaller than uh, your shock width, or what? Yeah, it's still less than the shock width. I mean, it's still not. I, I guess you would say it's not truly two dimensional anymore <laughs> when you have that degree of buckling. Yeah. And one interesting thing that the buckling actually does, though, is it moves by moving particles at slightly different heights, it gets one of them in the wake of another one. And that, that tends to promote some instabilities driven by ion flow. So there's ion flow in the side view camera from top to bottom. And normally that ion flow doesn't do a whole lot. But when you get one particle down, dust particle downstream of another in the wake of one up, upstream, uh, then you can get some instabilities that, that grow. And that uh, instability can actually pump energy into this um, uh, pulse into the shock and help keep the shock from dissipating. So that's one thing about this uh, buckling that is actually important is that it uh, promotes the uh, an instability which can then sustain the shock. Uh, I know that uh, you guys can uh, do few layers, not just one, uh, not many. Uh, you cannot sustain many kind of layers. Did you try to perform this shock experiments for Say a few layers uh, of uh, the. Well, that's a good question. Uh, no, we didn't. In order to make something that's stable with two layers, you have to use a lot higher gas pressure to suppress these ion driven instabilities. And when you get all that gas pressure, then the motion of your dust particles tends to be affected a lot by the, the, the gas density and the gas drag. And it's less uh, influenced by the Coulomb interactions of the particles. So that's why we didn't do that. Uh, but so there is this. Uh... Uh, method of experiments on the uh, International Space Center uh, or station. So therefore you could uh, actually do this experiment shockwave there. Uh, yep. There's no gravity, so then uh, you can, you actually have much more freedom there. You're right. There were a couple of experiments performed in the um, International Space Station, the facility called PK Nefedov, uh, where by chance a couple of shocks were observed a couple of different ways. And that was uh, in three dimensions, uh, which is kind of nice because most people live in a three dimensional world. And uh, yeah, and even though they had a high gas density, it was still possible for a shot to be observed there. So you're right about that. Okay, thank you. Pat, so uh, on your logic of it, it kind of sort of looks like a shock. So it's a shock to me. Uh, the most definitive aspect of a gas dynamic shock is the fact that while transport, you know, at viscosity or whatever, is required for heating or entropy production, to be more precise, the actual amount of entropy production you get is independent of the transport coefficient. Right, that's what, that's behind the whole finite time to steepening, blah, 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 et cetera. Uh, 
Is there any indication of that property here? Uh, I think probably what you're after is after something like a ranking Hugonio kind of analysis, perhaps. Uh, well, I'm uh, having I mean, to do with the energy in behind and ahead. Perhaps of the I mean I'm just curious if you put, you know, if you could analyze the rate of heating or the rate of of, of dissipation. That does that come out independent of of the molecular level diffusion coefficients or whatever the analogs here. That's to me the remarkable thing about the shock, that you need, you need some kind of transport to, for it to happen, but the amount of heating you get is independent of that transport. Mm -hmm. That's why you get finite time singularity, right? Okay, so uh, we certainly could measure temperatures uh, ahead kinetic temperatures ahead of the shock and behind the shock, but what we would not be able to very easily do is vary the transport coefficient as you're uh, but you might we, be we don't have a lot of control over that. You might be able to use the width as, a, you know, infer the transport coefficient from the width, mm -hmm. which you seem to be able to say something about. That's the point, yep. that okay. the width scales with the transport coefficient. So when you integrate over the shock, uh, dimension, the, the transport coefficient cancels. That's why mm -hmm. it's independent. The entropy production is independent of the transport coefficient. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, what, what you're talking about might be related to that argument that was uh, what I called the hydrodynamic model for a shock, um, where there was a kinematic viscosity divided by a speed and it gave a shock speed, and it gave a shock width, and that was for gas dynamics. And yeah, that one was bound to fail for us because the fundamental idea of, of viscosity as a hydrodynamic parameter fails if, uh, if hydrodynamics fail. Uh, yeah, well, my, my point is simply that just because it, it, it looks like a shock doesn't mean it's a shock. There are a lot of nonlinear things that look kind of sort of like shocks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, okay. it's, it's the, um, well, it's the finite time singularity to use pedantic words. That's the, that's the key property. Okay, thank you. See any other hands? No. Um, I was uh, actually sort of along similar lines. Uh, it looked like the density in front of, of the shock uh, was a decreasing function of distance from the shock. It kind of looked like a precursor to me of some kind. Um, and if you really squint at your data, uh, you could sort of see uh, oscillations behind the shock. I don't know whether those were real or is that something that you see all the time? Yep, um, right. So let's see, I'll zoom out here. So this is a, okay, so ahead of the shock, why is there that gradient there? That's just, it was already there before the shock came. Uh, the particle cloud is a little bit denser in the center and less dense at the edges. I um, see. So that, that was just part of the, you know, the target that we're hitting. These oscillations that you're seeing back there, yeah, there, there are definitely some oscillations back there. Um, that reminds me of uh, the sort of behavior that you see in a, uh, not a precise shock, but something that uh, where the, the nonlinearity is being balanced, uh, not only by dissipation as in a pure shock, but also by dispersion. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, two dimensional dust waves are quite dispersive as you know. So uh, it's possible that uh, you're, you're getting something in between a, uh, uh, a, a conoidal wave, which you would have with pure dispersion and a uh, shock, which you would have with pure dissipation. Yeah, yeah, so I get what you're after that, you know, like solitons and conoidal like uh, waveforms for nonlinear waves would have a, effects of both dispersion and for nonlinearity. One thing I'll mention yeah. here that we did we observed and don't have any explanation for is that the oscillations were often more profound in a liquid than in a solid target, which is kind of funny because uh, it, when you're shocking the solid, it melts anyway. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we got these in the wake of the shock. We're getting the oscillations primarily in the liquid. Don't don't have any explanation for that one. That's interesting. Uh, what do you think the uh, uh, width of that? Uh, fall off, does that have anything to do with the uh, gas? Uh, in, um, You're talking drag. about this uh, gradient at, at ahead of the shock? Yeah. 
Uh, no, the uh, the larger gradient uh, right at the shock front. Oh, okay. So what determines that gradient there? Uh, uh, could it be something to do with the gas drag? Well, the gas drag is a dissipative effect. And so that could contribute to, uh, you know, taking a discontinuity and making it uh, less singular. Um, so that could be one factor. One thing to keep in mind here, let's see, I'll go back and find a, a still image of the, the particles in, in a shock. Let's see. Okay, here we are. I'll zoom in on this one. Okay, so one thing is that I think that you fundamentally have to have at least a couple of interparticle spacings for the shock thickness because the shocks are happening because of interparticle collisions. <laughs> and you can't have mm -hmm. interparticle collisions at a, at a distant scale of less than an interparticle distance, I don't think. Uh, so I think that you're fundamentally got to be, you know, at least at one interparticle distance. And for us, it's working out to be about three. And so why three? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a, a good answer for that yet. Well, I suppose you could experimentally vary the gas pressure and see whether that has any effect on, any, uh, on it. Yeah, that, that would be one, one thing that could be varied and we did not try that. Uh, one thing that we did try varying, as I mentioned, was the, um, um, you know, the kinetic temperature of the target, right. whether the target was a, a liquid or a solid. And That's that one did make a difference, get a higher gradient in, in the liquid for, for reasons that we, we haven't been able to explain. All right, does uh, anybody have any other questions for, uh, for John? I don't see any hands raised. It looks like All right. Hands. Oh, okay, great. Uh, go ahead. When, how? Uh, yes, uh, so is there a, a critical speed for the, for the excite, exciter to, to observe that sharp drop of the gradient? I mean, even if you are like moving the exciter slowly, I would think you, you can, st can still observe like a gradual decrease of the density because you are like squ squeezing the particles in front of the exciter. So yes, that's certainly true. So um, yeah, so as, as, as if you just move the exciter more slowly, you're still squeezing the whole particle cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. is there a critical speed that you need to create that sharp drop? Um, you know, I'm not sure if we did a whole lot of experiments that were slower than about um, a Mach number of about two on the exciter. So I'm, I'm afraid that as an experimenter, I can't answer that question. We just didn't do those runs. Okay, thank you. So let's see, there's, a, yeah, right here, that, that was it. We did the, the runs with the exciter Mach number ranging from three to five. Just didn't try it at, uh, you know, like down to one. Okay. Anybody else? All right, uh, well, let's uh, virtually applaud for John. Uh, it was a nice talk. And uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming. Next week, uh, I'm told that the speaker is gonna be John Rice. So uh, come and listen to that. And I, I don't remember what his talk is gonna be about. Uh, but uh, okay. Thanks very much for coming and uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Thanks again, John. Oh, thanks, thank John. you. Thank thanks. you, John. Bye. Nice talk, John. Thanks, Dan. And thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, interesting stuff. I'm uh, so I'm guessing that you don't always attend this particular seminar. Uh, it, it comes and goes depending on what my schedule is and depending on who's speaking. Mm -hmm. um, quite, you know, from from time to time, I'll, I'll I'll be able to get in here for one, but uh, a lot of the time I'm busy this time of the day. I see. But, uh, I, I I made time for you this time though, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hope you have a good evening. Yeah. Thanks. You too. Thanks Bye -bye. for coming. Bye-bye.